so uh, tonight we are fortunate to have uh, Miriam Svetich as our speaker. So she is the Faye R. Langberg uh, Professor of Physics at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so Miriam received her PhD in uh, 1984 from University of Maryland. She spent three years as a postdoc at uh, SLAC, uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator. And uh, basically after that, after that stint, she moved to University of Pennsylvania and she's basically been there ever since. So um, Miriam uh, is uh, uh, regarded as an outstanding expert in many issues within string theory and consequences for particle physics and quantum gravity. Uh, so it ranges across a huge number of uh, possible subjects. I'll mention just a few that you know were of importance for me and when I was starting out as a graduate student. So for example, I was reading a lot of her papers on what are known as intersecting brain models, which relates to uh, making particle physics uh, scenarios connecting all the way from very short distances to things you might detect at particle accelerators. And you know, since that time, I've come to appreciate many other facets of her work uh, that I wasn't even aware of at the time in graduate school. So um, Miriam uh, has been elected a fellow of the Physical Soci American Physical Society since 2001. She won the University of Maryland Physics Distinguished Alumni Award in 2007. And uh, most recently, she was awarded a Frederick von Siemens Research Award uh, from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation in 2020. So she served as the editor for Physics Letters B for 20 years, starting going from 2000 to 2020 and uh, was recently appointed the lead editor of Physical Review D in uh, 2020. So what, saying all of that, uh, it's a great, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll wind up now. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, someone I consider uh, a mentor, a colleague, and also a friend. So please uh, welcome uh, Miriam Svetich. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for this very nice introduction. Uh, and also thank you to you and organizers to invite me to give this public lecture. Uh, so the goal that I have is to give you some insights from geometry and string theory for features of black holes or our understanding of black holes and some aspects of particle physics. So, the quest to understand and uncover secrets of nature in a geometric way has a really long history dating all the way back to Greek philosophers. Yes? Well, you know, I have to put, I have associations with uh, uh, other institutions uh, in my, yeah, country. Maribor and in the University of Ljubljana, but I'm on sabbatic leave at CERN, so I put all those things. And for some of it, I actually have to put it as acknowledging uh, support <laughs> from, from them. So anyway, with this digression, let's go to the real issues to uncover the secrets of nature. Uh, and so the geometric approaches have, as I said, a very long history by now dating all the way to Greek philosophers. And just to remind you, five platonic so uh, solids, polyhedra, were described at those times as five elements known at the time uh, of nature. Well, let's move forward to really more modern examples of such geometric links to nature. And the first one is Einstein's theory of gravity. And the second one is string theory, which is considered a prime candidate for unification of particle physics, namely electromagnetic, strong and weak forces of nature with consistent quantum theory of gravity. So in this talk, I'm going to highlight those geometric aspects precisely associated with Einstein's theory of gravity and string theory and focus on implications for black holes and particle physics. I do want to apologize that some aspects of this presentation will be somewhat biased by emphasizing uh, efforts that were developed at Penn. So the outline of my lecture will start with the brief history of modern physics, just to put in perspective how we arrive to modern 
uh, string theory. And there I'm going to emphasize specific role of objects that we call brains. And then in the second part, I'll address some of the implications of modern string theory, in particular the particle physics implications and the role of intersecting brains to describe particle physics. And then on the complementary side, I'll highlight implications for black holes and the insights that modern string theory can bring for understanding microscopic structure of black holes. And I'll conclude with some final remarks. So let's start with the very brief history of modern physics. We started with Newton's theory of gravity that describes the force between two massive objects to be proportional to the masses and to fall off with inverse square power of the distance between the massive objects. The description of this force is, of course, all encoded in flat three-dimensional space-time. Let's move fast forward. Not really yet, but let's just point out that Newton's theory of gravity is really working very well. It works very well on Earth. It works very well in solar systems, system, as well as for galaxies. But now let's move forward to the 20th century and add to space the four dimension time. This is key in generalizing the Newton's theory of gravity to what we call Einstein's theory of gravity, where now a new con geometric conceptual aspect appears, namely the geometry of space and time now becomes curved. And it's curved due to the presence of massive objects. So, for example, sun curves space-time, and planets follow fixed motion due to Einstein's theory of gravity around the sun, and they have to follow particular motion due to geodesic, uh, uh, following basically a minimum path geodesic motion in this curved space-time. So actually, within Einstein's theory of gravity, planetary orbits can be explained geometrically. An example, again, of geometry here. Einstein's theory of gravity becomes really relevant for uh, explanations of early cosmological questions, in particular, the evolution of the early universe. But I will not say in this lecture much about this part of implications of Einstein's theory of gravity. I will emphasize the other aspects of Einstein's theory, namely, it predicts black holes that were quite dramatically confirmed in recent experiments. So black holes are very special objects which have very high mass density. And as a consequence, they curve the space-time so much that objects traveling toward it reach, at some point, a location of no return. So this location of no return we refer to as horizon. And objects can then continue to travel further and eventually, at least in Einstein's theory of gravity, hit a space-time singularity. So black holes as such objects have mass, they can rotate, they have angular momentum, they can also have charge, and as I mentioned, they are equipped with the horizon. A surprising property 
that was discovered in early mid 70s is that black holes actually behave as thermodynamic objects. We can associate entropy, a degree of disorder associated with black hole. And we can associate the temperature that goes along. And interestingly enough, this thermodynamic entropy is described if we set lots of constants, lots of units to one, only with the area of the horizon, namely the area of the location of no return with the extra one quarter factor. Correspondingly, the temperature of this thermodynamic object is associated with the strength of the gravity force, gravitational force on the horizon. So temperature is in inversely proportional to the surface gra gravity at the horizon. So those are quite intriguing, unexpected properties. And the first natural question that one wants to ask oneself is, can we find statistical, microscopic explanation of this thermodynamic property of the black hole. Namely, what are the microscopic degrees of freedom that describe statistical entropy associated with this geometric property that we call one quarter of the area of the horizon? So this is an important big puzzle that was initiated at the time. Okay? But I will address that in the later part of my lecture. So let's move on with the brief history and address another feature of nature, namely as we move to smaller distances, uh, those of the size of the atoms, we observe the new phenomenon of nature, namely the particles are not localized anymore, they become fuzzy. So for example, if we are looking at the excitation of electron in the hydrogen atom, it's actually those excitations are not localized in space and we can only determine the probability density for electron to be at different excitation levels like this. So the fact that we cannot pinpoint both the location of a particle and its momentum at the same time, has been quantified under the principle that we call uncertainty principle, namely the fuzziness of the location and the fuzziness of the momentum of a particle, this product is bounded from below by a constant that we call Planck constant. And this is the essence of describing quantum phenomena in nature, namely at much smaller distances and resulted in the birth of quantum mechanics. So principles of quantum mechanics are valid not only at the atomic level, but they go down to smaller distances, to nuclear uh, distances and even to subnuclear regime. Even more, they were verified all the way to very high energies by studying scattering experiments of elementary particles at large particle colliders. So as we go to really very high energies, we observe new phenomena, namely that now particles can be created and annihilated. So in this case, we can describe quantum interactions between particles to take place in space-time via exchanges of virtual particles that mediate those interactions. So these quantum processes can be quantified by what we call Feynman diagrams, and they lead to the birth of quantum field theory, namely another refinement of quantum mechanics. So quantum field theory of elementary particles 
turns out to be consistent quantum theory that describes at the quantum level electromagnetic strong and weak forces of nature and goes nowadays under the name of the standard model. So let me just say a few more things about the standard model. So as I am uh, referring to, it's describing a quantum field theory that is based on a special symmetry. We refer to it, the so-called gate symmetry, specified by certain symmetry groups, where actually each of the symmetry group has particles, gauge bosons, associated with it, like gluons of strong interaction, W bosons of weak interactions, and photon of electromagnetic interactions. And these gauge bosons mediate quantum interactions about among what we call matter particles. And those are our quarks and leptons, namely electrons and neutrinos, that are charged under this group symmetry. And they specify for, for us the matter content of nature. And they turn out to come in three copies. We call them three families. Standard model also has to include another particle, the Higgs particle, which is responsible actually for symmetry breaking of weak uh, electroweak unified force into just electromagnetic force, and at the same time is responsible for giving mass to matter. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into more details about it, but all these key features of quantum field theory of standard model, all these building blocks have been tested in glorious details, in particular in the largest Hadron Collider in the world that is running right now at CERN, Switzerland. That's where I'm, as I said, I am on sabbatic leave there. And this is a huge, it is large collider where protons are collided and then they create many particles that are detected by two huge detectors. So the tests of those building blocks actually were verified at the state-of-the-art collider and culminated just about 10 years ago with the discovery of the Higgs particle. Any questions so far? Have I lost you? <laughs> Okay, now keep on going. So I try to argue that we have a beautiful, consistent quantum field theory of strong, weak, and electromagnetic forces that goes under the name of the standard model. So one would naturally want to ask oneself, how about quantum theory of gravity. Can we describe now gravity as a quantum field theory? And we, when we try to do that, we would introduce quantum particles called gravitons that would mediate quantum interactions with matter, particles that carry matter. Well, when we try to do this, we face a stumbling block because unlike the standard model, we encounter inconsistencies, namely infinities, that we cannot get rid of. So the naive quantization, making classical Einstein's gravity quantum, produces for us actually inconsistent quantum theory of gravity because of those infinities. So search for a consistent quantum theory of gravity is the holy grail of theoretical physics. So here now I would like to argue how this search is leading us to string theory. So 
to talk about string theory, we have to go to even smaller distances, where we start encountering not point-like, but extended objects. They extend a string, they have one extra extension, and they move in space and time. So where do elementary particles come from in string theory? They come as quantum excitations of those strings. So for example, matter or particles describing standard model would come as special quantum excitations of strings. Well, how about graviton? The beautiful property of string theory is that graviton always appears as massless quantum excitation of strings. Okay. And the way we could see that is the observation that strings are extended. So the quantum states that come from strings depend on two sectors, one that depends on one combination of string coordinates and what we call love moving, and the other combination of string coordinates that we could uh, uh, call right moving sector. So since all excitations of strings are built out of this left and right moving sectors, the one that is associated with graviton appears when we are looking at the left moving excitations that get excited in all space-time directions, and so do the right-moving ones. And we always have those excitations in string theory, okay? So this produces for us excitation that describes quantum state with the symmetry and properties of a graviton. So string theory always has graviton as quantum excitations, and so, String theory contains quantum gravity, so that's good. That's why we want to study it. But now, let's study string theory that contains graviton as quantum excitation. Okay. So now we are describing interactions of strings, extended objects that travel in space and time, and their interactions are now associated with joining and splitting of strings. And the strength of these interactions will denote with the string coupling. This, is, this tells us how strong this effect of splitting or joining is. Now, because strings are extended objects, they interact now at extended location in space and time, unlike particles. So interactions are actually softer, less divergent. Actually, it turns out that these interactions produce no infinities. So this is a theory that at the quantum level is consistent with no infinities. And since it always contains graviton as massless excitation, string theory is a finite theory of quantum gravity. And this remains one of our primary reasons why we are excited about and study string theory. Well, this sounds all great, but there is a little hitch. It is a consistent quantum theory without those infinities, anomalies, not in four dimensions, three space, one time, but actually in 10 dimensions, nine space, one time. But, well, our world is three space one time. So what do we do with six extra dimensions that we get as a condition that the string theory is consistent quantum theory of gravity? So what do we do with them? Well, we have to get rid of them. So we have to make these six extra dimensions very small tiny, so small that we don't see them in, in current collider experiments, okay? So the way one envisions our curling up of extra 
six dimensions is that we view our three plus one flat space there and we attach to that extra six tiny dimensions. Okay. But they are of very small sizes, expected to be like 10 to the minus 30 to 33 centimeters, like Planckian sizes we talked about when strings appear. Anyway, to make now string theory in three plus one dimensions consistent, we have to choose specific compact spaces. They have to have some special curvature and we call those spaces after uh, mathematicians, Calabi. Actually, he's emeritus professor close to 100 from UPenn and Yao who is still very dynamic, mathematicians, mathematician. In any case, we have to choose this six dimensional space to be special, of special curvature, so we call them calabi yau space. But a very special symmetric example of such spaces would be tori. If I put three tori like that, that would be six compact dimensions. So three donuts together, this would be six extra dimensions. Make them extremely small and put them in extra dimension on top of our three plus one dimensional space. Okay, so we make this extra dimensions very small. And so we want to ask ourselves, what is the role of those extra dimensions for describing our physics, physics in our three and one dimension? Well, I would like to bring here a new perspective of the role of these extra dimensions that is brought with introduction of, <coughs> excuse me, of another type of new objects, which we call brains. Okay. You got used to particles, you got used to strings. Okay, now you'll have to get used to brains, okay? Just in, in very naive terms, one would view brains, they would be membranes in our three plus one dimensional space. But as we go to higher dimensions, those are higher extension objects. So brains are somewhat generalization of membranes to dimensions bigger than four. And, you know, string theory is 10 dimensional, okay? And it's this new type of objects that put modern perspective on string theory and will also have implications that I'm leading toward particle physics now in string theory and black hole physics. Okay, let me go on and remind you, I, we already dealt with excitations of string theory. Actually, the closed strings produce for us always massless excitation that we call graviton, describing gravity, okay? But now we also have open strings, not just closed ones, all right? And now the brains will be viewed as boundaries of these open strings. In addition, we can add charges to the ends of those brains, uh, sorry, to the ends of those open strings that end now on what we call brain boundary, okay? So in this picture, when string theory is weakly coupled, small string coupling, open string excitations that end on these brains can carry charges and they live on those brains because they are effectively attached to these boundaries, okay? So we are talking about charges. So that right away screams for describing particle physics. So let me try to quantify the role of these brains in string theory for particle physics in four dimensions in our world, okay? So that's the first part. So how are we going now? Focus just, I'm gonna talk about brains, but think of them boundaries of open strings, okay? So these brains will fill out our three space and one time directions. 
So we'll live on a brain, okay? But of course, we have extra six dimensions. So we have brains filling up our space, but we have extra compact six dimensions. And now these brains can extend in this extra six dimensions. But now this compact space above is tiny and small, so brains can now wrap in these internal space cycles because they extend also in internal space, but that's compact space, they can wrap cycles. So now if we view these brains as boundaries of open strings, when we look at the open strings that start and end on those brains that wrap cycles, they will produce in four dimensions for us particles that mediate interactions in the standard model, like photon or gluons or W bosons, coming from brains wrapping different cycles, okay? But now, in internal space, as brains, different brains wrap different cycles, they can intersect there. And at those intersections, a new phenomenon happens. Because now, we can have open strings that start on one set of brain wrapping one cycle and end on another set of brain wrapping another uh, type of cycle. And one can show that excitations that come from those strings that end on one brain and, end, and uh, start on one brain and end on another results in particles that we call matter, like quarks and leptons. So these brains provide for us geometric way of describing how we get photons, gluons, W particles, and how we get matter, quarks and leptons in a uh, description of string theory with uh, compactify down to four dimensions and with brains, okay? So this intersecting brain picture provides for us solutions in four dimensions for particle physics, and I tried to argue its geometric nature, and of course that led to the first examples of three family, three copies of quarks and leptons and the symmetry of the standard model. But there's a lot of work on that and no time for details. How much time do I have? Not much, right? Uh, well, still, 25 minutes. <laughs> okay. So, so this was the one picture. Now let's go, let's describe these brains differently. There is actually what we call a dual way of describing these extended objects. They can be viewed as having certain mass per, per volume, word volume of this brain. So they are massive objects, gravitational objects that will start curving space-time. So this is some dual picture that is related to original picture when that was just boundary of open streak that started back reacting and producing now gravitational objects where string coupling is actually large. When string coupling is low, uh, uh, small, we are dealing with brains that are boundaries of open strings, and we can calculate all these excitations of brains. But then there is another limit when the string coupling is very strong, and their brains become gravitational objects. And all we see is their gravitational nature they curve space-time. Okay. Now, one would be, uh, ask oneself, does it make any sense to look in this regime of the brain, of brain descriptions and describe particle physics there? Because we are somehow now in the regime of large coupling and brains, gravitational objects. And actually, there is. So let's try to see what the effect in this regime of large coupling is for particle physics. So now in this regime, brains are gravitational objects, okay? They back react and they curve space-time. They still fill out our space, but in internal space, those cycles that 
original brains in recoupling RAP now become back reacted due to gravitational nature of brains and they start curving. These cycles become more and more curved and cause internal space to become singular. And basically due to the fact that string coupling is now strong in this regime. Okay. And we can actually uh, describe now this new space, not the Calabia, but some back reacted space that is overall singular due to back reaction of brains. And its geometry can be described by string theory at large coupling that we call F theory. So how do we extract from this back reacted picture of brains particle physics? It turns out that charged particles in this limit, in this regime, can be described as appearing due to the type of singularities caused by this back reacted brain. So there's well prescribed connection between singularity, geometry of the space, and what kind of charged particles we get in this regime of uh, the brain picture. And it turns out that we can employ fancy geometric techniques and get huge landscape of standard model in this context. But no time to tell you about that. Since we are uh, here also, as Jonathan mentioned, studying quantum field theory at this workshop, uh, at this conference, I would like to highlight also some further related developments in the context of particle physics. So what I was explaining to you is that string theory includes gravity and includes particle physics. Okay. And the way we saw these features appearing is uh, by studying constraints that come from this geometry of this compact space. So string theory as consistent theory of quantum gravity and particle physics produces the constructions of particle physics with quantum gravity that are constrained. And this constraint comes from this geometry of this compact space. Okay. And so one expects that particle physics of any consistent quantum gravity should be subject to some additional constraints. Okay. And to quantify those constraints, and eliminate theories that are not consistent with quantum gravity uh, goes under the program that we refer to a swampland program. And systematic study of such physical conditions that would make particle physics consistent with quantum theory of gravity and that would reflect the original geometric constraints that we got from string theory to describe uh, uh, quantum gravity is, is large part of the effort nowadays and also part of the uh, topics of the current conference at the Aspen Center for Physics. Okay, so I have now not much left. I thought I gave you some glimpse how modern string theory tells us about geometry of particle physics together with consistent quantum gravity. I still owe you some of the descriptions or impact of modern string theory for black holes. So let me return back to black holes. Okay. Well, black holes in string theory, I mean, we already have the right candidates for it. The dual brain interpretation, namely interpretation of brains as gravitational objects, massive extended objects that curve space time. And that has natural implication to describe black holes. So I'm going to turn to description of black holes due to brains in this regime when they are gravitational objects and see what role does brains play for black holes. Well, before I do this, let me remind you that the thing that we observe in classical theory uh, of uh, Einstein's gravity is that black holes behave as thermodynamic objects with thermodynamic entropy one quarter of the area of the horizon. And what we want to ask ourselves is how to relate it to statistical entropy, namely how we identify the microscopic degrees of black holes, count them, 
take the logarithm and describe statistical entropy of the system. And can the statistical entropy indeed be related to this thermodynamic entropy that is one quarter of the area of the horizon? So what I want to finish my talk with is to highlight how string theory puts, gives some insights into describing this microscopic degrees associated with the statistical entropy and how it's related to thermodynamic entropy. Okay, so to show you this connection, let me go now, as I was already indicating, to describing black holes in string theory as brains that are gravitational objects. So brains as gravitational objects would wrap different cycles and back react, and we could view the cycles of in, uh, that, that brains wrap as intersecting ones. So we can view that again as intersecting brains in the gravitational limit. But what we see now in this case is in our four-dimensional, three plus one-dimensional space, brains look like point-like objects because in our space they would describe black holes, point-like uh, uh, gravitational objects, okay? And now, because we have different brains wrapping different cycles in internal space, each of them, each of them soars the effective charge of this black hole. So we could have brains made out of different charges associated with different type of cycles that brains wrap, okay? And so one of these early black holes was studied a long time ago, actually uh, found a long time ago, and one was able to calculate the area of the horizon of this, that black hole multiplied with one quarter and get the thermodynamic entropy. It turns out that this black hole had finite horizon. Its area was proportional to the square root of the product of those four charges, and that was the actual result. So this is the gravitational side of brains and the type of black holes we get. But now let's go to the other side of brains where brains are boundaries of open strings. So let's go to weak string coupling regime. So we can also describe this phenomenon now as boundaries of open strings that trap different cycles. And we can count how many excitations of open strings we have for this particular description of intersecting cycles that boundaries of open strings wrap. So one can actually precisely calculate the number of these degrees by looking at the string excitations, for example, that start on one cycle and end on the another cycle of different brains. So this can be done precisely and one can calculate the logarithm of these excitations that we get. These excitations are actually at the energy level, the same as the original mass of the black hole. So anyway, this counting can be done precisely, and it was done shortly after this paper, with the, uh, and the results turned out to give the precisely the same answer. So that was the beauty of having two dual description of brains and two ways of looking at black holes as gravitational objects and in the dual picture we see now microscopic degrees that we can calculate and the answer gives us the same value. So this is actually a, a beautiful new conceptual insight that modern string theory and brains brought to us. I have to emphasize that the black holes I was mentioning are very special black holes. So this counting of microscopic degrees of black holes was done really for special ones, namely the so-called extremal black holes that have mass related to the charge. Mass is not independent. They are special symmetric black holes that have mass equal to the sum over those charges. We call them extremal black holes. But actually the study of the microscopic feature of this black holes by this dual picture brain has been soon after formalized 
made systematic via what we call gravity field theory correspondence. Namely, one could study string theory in curved gravitational background and relate properties of this theory to specific quantum field theory that lives on the boundary of the space-time. So for microscopic study of extremal black holes, we can formalize things that I explained earlier by identifying for these extremal black holes the geometry, the space-time in the horizon regime of those black holes. And it turns out to be very special space-time with negative cosmological constant, which, which we call anti Sitter space. Okay. And we can now relate this geometry of the near horizon regime to the dual field theory, a special field theory, which we call conformal field theory, that lives on the boundary. So this quantification has been done and expanded for numerous other examples of black holes, not, not just this one that I mentioned, and pushed black holes in different dimensions and so on. It did even more. This correspondence between gravity and field theory has grown into a very broad field with numerous applications to systems that have strongly interacting field theories. Right? Namely, our gravitational can be described as gravitational systems. And those include many systems in condensed matter physics. Last but not least, the, the results that I was showing you are 20 year plus years old, but there have been many other important advances. In particular, recent studies of black holes have focused more on dynamic properties of black holes, namely late time black hole evolution, entanglement entropy, dynamical things, and connections to information theory but all really primarily for extreme on black hole. Never, nevertheless, this is a huge field, and I think this topic will be large topic of the conference next week. Here, but I don't have time to tell you about that, okay? <laughs> but I want to say one more thing, just one more thing up my alley, okay? Which is asking oneself, well, I showed you how the brains, this dual picture can explain internal structure of black hole, microscopics of black hole. But those were only special black holes, extremal ones. So you want to ask, in nature, we have different black holes that don't have mass equal to charge. Most of black holes don't have any charge. That would mean, for extremal one, no mass, no black hole. We really want to study properties, internal structure, microscopics of black holes that have mass that is bigger. It's independent parameter, but mass bigger than the sum of those charges, and they can also rotate. Okay. So this is, of course, big outstanding question. Okay. And uh, it's useful to study those properties for particular prototype black holes in string theory. And those would be black holes that would be, we get in four dimensions by taking string theory that I started with and not compacting on general Calabria space, but on special symmetric donuts. Okay. It turns out to be explicit, and we can find explicitly black hole solutions, uh, also non-extremal one. And I should mention, this four charge one that I showed you, the extremal one, is actually the extremal one of this sector of string theory. Anyway, uh, just one short slide. There, it's really very tantalizing that also those non-extremal black holes in string theory have very particular features. For example, if one studies their thermodynamics, it's very compelling and very suggestive that there must be some dual field theory description in terms of some conformal special quantum field theory in two dimensions. So just the structure of thermodynamics is screaming for that. But we cannot pinpoint this specific microscopic degrees of freedom. There were some attempts to put these black holes in what we would call bat box to extract this conformal dual theory feature manifestly okay, uh, without changing the fact that the black hole is non-extremal 
Okay. And there were some intriguing connections also to some two-dimensional gravity and condensed matter system, but really this is just something up my alley that, that, that I don't want to bother you with. The point is we are not there yet. We are not there. We cannot identify cleanly the dual structure, field theory microscopic structure of black holes that are non-extremal. Okay, so just a few concluding remarks. So I try to highlight some modern developments in string theory and point out insights that they shed on unifying origin of particle physics and quantum gravity. So presented highlights for geometric origin of particle physics with these intersecting brains and F-theory, but also advances for uh, understanding microscopic interpretation of black hole entropy, including some, some partial advances also for non-extremal black holes. Well, I hope I have convinced you that we have gained some important insights into our quest to unify forces of nature, including quantum gravity, and that string theory plays a very important role there. I also try to emphasize how important and deep links there are in string theory between the geometry and the physics consequences. As I pointed out also is, there are many open questions and not well understood issues, and clearly this work in theoretical physics is continues to be work in progress. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Miriam. Um, okay. So we have some time for questions. So just, has anybody got a question? Yes. Uh, Here, you want it the mic? Uh, two questions. Uh, one is uh, about, you said that the black holes have entropy. And um, since very early age, we learned that entropy is always increasing and the examples given are that uh, a broken egg cannot be put back together or perfume out of a exactly. bottle. Exactly. So how, does, uh, how do black hole geometry changes uh, as entropy increases? And this, mm -hmm. the second question is uh, another great discovery of, uh, or another feather in Einstein's theory of relativity has been the discovery of uh, gravitational waves uh, recently. And does string theory say anything about uh, gravitational waves or is there a uh, <coughs> mm -hmm. string theory interpretation of gravitational waves? Okay, well the first uh, question is, uh, um, this is the second law of thermodynamics that actually this order gets only worse as time. Uh, so one has to study um, a dynamical processes, right, in this context, and Bekenstein was doing precisely that. He was adding more mass to the black hole and see what happens to the entropy as one is doing with that. And he always found that this, this object that I call entropy really has the property that it always increases. So, uh, of course, you know, there are beautiful things called uh, first law of thermodynamics, how the change in mass is related to change in entropy. All these quantities, they perfectly work. All these complicated black holes all follow those rules and satisfy this property. Okay. Yeah, the second thing, gravitational waves. They are consequence already of the classical theory of gravity, of Einstein's theory of gravity. So string theory reproduces that at the quantum level, right? So per se, this is really more verification of the limit of gravity that is consistently described by Einstein's theory of gravity. But as the studies of precision measurements with gravitational waves over the next decade will improve. We hope that we would see new things that would point to deviations beyond Einstein's theory of gravity. And there's also a lot of work. So what would be further things that could be characteristic of phenomena that could come from string theory and could be only detected as we go to more precision? Thank you. Questions for Miriam? Yeah, there's one in the back.
That's a very good question. Okay. Because a lot of the things that I was describing here was more of a kinematic thing. I typically, I want you to describe particle physics. So I want to typically keep this extra dimension not to evolve with time. But in cosmological con uh, context, they do. And those are things that one should address, which is cosmology coming from string theory. And th those are also, this is a broad field, but I chose it not to go into that because I'm not working much on it. But it's expected, indeed, that those dimensions also could evolve over time and could describe early, uh, early universe, early properties of um, um, and cosmology. So uh, a very good point. Yeah, please. Yes. Yes, very good point, very good point. So spaghetti could start and end on brain, you know? And you wiggle it and then whatever comes out of this spaghetti stays on a lasagna, okay? That was the, the thing. <laughs> Um, no, it, it's really of a bigger extent. Uh, you see, when you think of spaghetti, it's really tiny. It, it's a very small extent, right? So technically, the way you see that, this extra dimension, right? Lasagna has an extra large dimension. Spaghetti has this extra large, this, that is so small that we neglect it in the description. Well, uh, there is, you know, somehow yeah, in this picture is, how to say, they, they are like a boundary. They provide, you see, like think of strings being attached to this. Think, think of lasagna not being dynamic, but strings are dynamic. And they are stuck. They are stuck to those, to lasagna. And they wiggle. And they create particles that are pretty much stuck on this non-dynamic lasagna, okay? This is one limit, okay? You want the whole dynamics. That's complicated. I went to another extreme where I make this brain all dynamic, right? But I forgot the string sort of disappeared because coupling was so strong, you know? It's, so this is... But, but the analogies you're drawing are really perfect analogies, and you're asking a hard question that we cannot completely solve, which is in between. In between is always hard. It's on the, on the extremes that we have the techniques in physics. Okay. So I hope I, I gave you a, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, in theoretical physics, I don't think it's different outlook. The principles we are using are the same, but they may apply it to different phenomena, okay? Nobody's denying that this black hole that I was talking about is a consistent solution and all that, right? But other people have done maybe other aspects and generalizations. So when I'm putting those dots, I mean, there's lots of other work, okay? Right? But it's consistent. It goes in other directions, other refinements, other properties, right? But be, like there was question about time-dependent right, things, cosmology. I haven't mentioned any of it. Huge field, right? I also mentioned about swampland program. Huge field, right? And then I quote myself, it's really not right, frankly. <laughs> so you guys argue? No, we don't argue. We just implement each other's ideas. Because you see, our, it's not like philosophy. It's not like humanities. Our techniques, methods by which are compatible with each other. We don't argue this is inconsistent thing with each other. We just get new results, or somebody else is, uh, uncovers new concept 
within this consistency picture that we have. And then we all jump on it. Okay. But it's not that, that it's like philosophical outlook and then we argue. It's not like this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, back there. They are, right? This is, but you see, there is another thing. We don't know where our real world lives. I constructed lots of standard models. I constructed lots of standard models in the limit when brains are just boundaries of strings in this limit, when lasagna is just static, right? And then I constructed lots of models when brains are gravitational. And we have, you know, deep geometric techniques there, right? But there is a big question that goes under the name of landscape. Which of these beautiful solutions that we get will at the end be chosen by nature? What we are doing is we are like engineers. We engineer consist with all the consistency argument, something that looks like particle physics, that looks like standard. In this regime, when coupling is weak and brains are not gravitational, say, or in the other regime, when strings disappear and brains curve space, and that's, that's a difficult, strong coupling regime, but we have new techniques. All right, have I answered or at least explained? I think so. so yeah. So, yeah. I, yeah. I just don't know where I'm sitting in real world yet, <laughs> okay? And to really, if, if you really want to directly probe we would have to have colliders of huge energies that would probe 10 to the minus 30 centimeters, you know, regime where compactification can be probed. Very small distances, very high energies, where we can start probing this stuff and can start probing how brains behave there. Okay. More questions? Yeah, yes. over here. I'm on sabbatical leave, yes. Yeah, there. Yes, for this year. What's that experience like? Well, you know, it's, it's a bit tainted because of COVID, unfortunately, like experience for all of us in all facets of our life. Uh, the fall was very nice. You know, they have a very strong theory division there. And so they are, they are strong interactions. They support also visits of other theories. Right now, this huge collider, when we interact with experimentalists, is being closed and upgraded to higher energies. But there are experimentalists here. We just got a message, right, Jonathan, about two graduate students from Penn yes. who are now there and want to learn quantum field theory experimentalists, and I'll meet them for coffee and discuss <laughs> things. But anyway, uh, uh, CERN was always very stimulating environment for me, and I spent lots of summers there. Okay, any questions? Well, we had a lot, so maybe let's thank Miriam again.